Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar presented with program partners Shuko. Sound, light and air, balancing comfort with environmental performance. In a moment, your chair, Ruth Slavid, but first, Shuko UK's Commercial Director, Sean Butler. Welcome to the latest in our series of 80 Shuko webinars. We know that indoor air quality, lighting and acoustic performance play a vital role in supporting health and well-being but how do we provide comfort for occupants whilst balancing environmental concerns? In today's webinar, we will look at how we can design buildings that meet our carbon targets, but also improve the well-being of the occupants by maximizing natural light and fresh air. We have three expert speakers who each bring unique authority, knowledge and experience to the challenges of how to balance environmental performance by developing innovative and creative ventilation and lighting designs that benefit clients and occupants, as well as meet carbon targets. We know that buildings cause more than 40% of the CO2 emissions in Europe, and it's critical that we massively improve the performance and efficiency of all buildings. Sustainability means designing, constructing and operating a property in such a way that it is ecologically, economically and socially future-proof, and we are fully committed at Shuko to provide outstanding products and solutions for helping deliver comfortable buildings that will also meet carbon targets. I think today's presentation will raise many crucial issues for all those interested in the challenges of the future and our ability to design buildings that support health and well-being and are also sensitive to all our ecological and economic needs. Thank you once again for joining us. I'll now pass you to Ruth, who's chairing today's event. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I'm delighted to be here because, as Sean said, this is a really important topic. We're suddenly having to balance our wellness concerns with our uh, very deep environmental concerns and, of course, the ventilation demands of COVID as well. Uh, I think in addition to that, we all had a wake up call and were reminded um, just how important light and air are to most of us when there was that very justifiable fuss um, about that building at Munger Hall at the University of California when they were proposing a building with almost no windows for the students living in it. And guess what? People didn't think it was a good idea. Anyway, I'm sure that none of the people um, who are speaking to us today uh, would say, would propose anything as daft as that. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers. Before I tell you about them, I'd just like to remind you all that one of the strengths of these webinars is that we can have such good discussions with our speakers. Uh, we will have a short question and answer session after each presentation, and then they will all come together at the end uh, for a longer discussion. And in those times, I will be putting some of the most interesting questions that you have sent in to the speakers. This of course requires you to send in the questions. So as something occurs to you, don't think, oh yeah, I'll send that in as a question later, because my belief is you'll forget it, um, but it would be great to have those questions and that will make our discussion even more lively, I'm sure. So we are going to be hearing today uh, from two engineers, uh, from Nick Cramp at Max Fordham and also from Dr. Sean Fitzgerald uh, at the Centre for Climate Repair. Um, but before either of them speak, our first speaker, I'm delighted to say, is Alina White, uh, who is an associate at Fields and Clegg Bradley Studios. Alina, over to you. Hello, and thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you a talk about Three Chamberlain Square and some of the moves we've made in relation to wellbeing and carbon. We started with very high aspirations with the client uh, to produce uh, not only a landmark building, an amazing site, but also looking at what a workplace would be uh, in the midst of the pandemic, um, how it can be a smart, healthy and flexible, agile space to adapt to future work practices that at this point we don't fully know what they might be. And we're also targeting a net zero carbon building. Uh, Three Chamberlain Square is in Birmingham. It's part of the Paradise development for MEPC and uh, two of the buildings on site have already been constructed. That's one Chamberlain Square, two Chamberlain Square and we're three Chamberlain Square next to the 
um, fantastic town hall and other buildings on site are also in construction. So first question to ask really with any building, if you're considering carbon is, do we need to build? Well, here we have um, an amazing central, central Birmingham site. Um, we're next to some fantastic buildings and the site is currently clear and ready to build on. So we feel that this is a good bit place to be building a new building. When we looked at um, the start of our design, we considered what makes a great office building and what will make a great office building now and into the future. Uh, we're looking at how you can bring outside in, maximize daylight, create, uh, use natural ventilation and create an adaptable space whilst also making it a low embodied and low operational carbon building. The site that we have uh, when you extrude it is almost a cube and we took inspiration from the town hall next door, dividing the building into a base, middle and top. We then pushed the base in to create better connection to the public space around and we chamfered the top to allow daylight down in between uh, the buildings. And we used different angles to respond to different aspects around the site with a much shallower angle towards the town hall as the views across the town hall are quite critical. We then um, took a slice out of the building to create winter gardens or terraces and uh, balcony spaces to create internal and external space on, um, on most of the office floor plates. We worked around the elevation with a regular grid of vertical fins and then we articulated both florid columns at the base and around the top of the building and finally added some solar shading horizontal elements to the south face of the building. And this is how the building looked at planning. Um, we're just completing stage three, so this is still quite current. And this is the, the key section here where you see the winter gardens and the terraces spaces giving most of the office floor plates connection to external space um, overlooking the town hall and overlooking down towards Chamberlain Square. As you go up the building, we change the terraces from winter gardens to open terraces and then a long terrace on the top at the ninth floor. Typical floor plate is almost a square with a central core and cutouts for the winter garden spaces. That's a typical winter garden space. And the terrace on the upper level looking back across Birmingham. On the ninth floor, we have plant to one side, a long strip of office and a full terrace across the whole eastern edge of the building. And some views of how this might look. We extended the facade pergola to create a, a kind of an enclosure to the space, even though it's fully open. So carbon is also quite an important part of our brief here down. Um, for operational carbon, it forms a large part. But as we move towards a decarbonized grid, um, we'll find that the operational carbon is actually a lower proportion and the embodied carbon, both in the initial build and the maintenance and refurbishment cycles for the building become more significant. And um, looking at the embodied carbon, typical office, the substructure and the structure form a large part of it. And we used our FCB carbon tool early on in the design process to consider different options on how we might make some impacts on reducing embodied carbon. And we worked with Cundles, um, who've done a full assessment, uh, and this is their data. So we have managed to reduce from a typical office and uh, achieving less than 600, which equates to a Letty rating C. Uh, some of the ways we've done that is re significantly reducing the substructure and the structure proportions of carbon. So the structure does make a big difference, and an early move we made was to to include a row of columns in the mid floor plate using a 7.5 meter grid and this allowed us to reduce the slab and reduce the quantity of carbon. Uh, Cundles looked at um, a number of different options with us. Initially we had hoped to be able to have as much timber and CLT in the building but uh, this was less favoured by the insurers and when we did analysis on um, the structural systems that could be used, post uh, 
attention to concrete actually came out quite well if you before you include the sequestration in the, the CLT. See, another big part of um, the design that has a really significant effect on well-being and carbon is the facade. And the facade is having to work really hard, both in terms of um, allowing daylight in, allowing for natural ventilation, views and visual connections to the town hall and the setting are really important in this building. Also reducing carbon with um, good air tightness and very low U values. Materially, we've worked with uh, trying to use materials honestly and um, to utilize their best uh, characteristics. So most of the building is terracotta with terracotta ribs, terracotta um, spandrel elements, but then down at the base of the building where we have these very florid um, sculptural forms, we felt that it would be better to use a concrete or a GRC material that could be molded. Uh, There's some views of the base of the building with these um, sculptural columns that connect together and then form fan out under the underside of the level two. And the middle of the building, you see the inspiration here from the town hall with the base, middle and top. And the top of the building where we repeat the, the, the florid columns across the pergola of the terrace and around the crown of the building. So the typical body of the building is where we have worked the hardest in terms of um, making that facade work for us, both in terms of um, thermal performance, which pushes you towards wanting to have smaller windows, um, but also in terms of view connection, daylight and natural ventilation. So we've placed the windows higher up on the facade with a solid element at the, at the bottom so that we can get the daylight back into the deep plan. And in every other bay we've included for an opening window and this will help ventilate that first seven and a half meters of the floor plate. And um, although the building is mechanically serviced, uh, as we move forward and Birmingham moves to more electric cars and lower external noise levels, uh, opening windows will become more of an option, particularly in the start and the end of the day and in the shoulder season. So as a working practice perhaps moves away from fixed hours, having openable windows will, will definitely help reduce the need for mechanical services during those times. Another aspect on this building that came up um, for um, consideration was whether we should use double or triple glaze. Now, the triple glaze is obviously much better in terms of U-value performance and overall energy performance for the operational energy. But to have triple glaze, you need an extra pane of glass and some more spaces. So you use more embodied carbon at the very start of the building. And um, Kundles again did some analysis on this. And as we see from the graph here, um, the overall carbon used for double and triple glazed is actually relatively similar. And uh, the big dependence is on how the grid decarbonizes. If it doesn't decarbonize that well, triple glazed is better. But if the decarbonization goes very well, then double glazed is better. Um, internally, as architects, we need to consider the, the finishes and how we are designing the building. So things like raised access floor systems aren't particularly great for carbon, but they're very useful for flexibility across the building and there are good reclaimed systems to use. But uh, we should be aware that screed is much worse than raised access floor system. And um, partitions, well, they do use carbon, but we also need to consider that block work and other materials perhaps use more. So build wisely and design efficiently. Services can also have a big impact. And um, this is an area where uh, carbon is still being really understood. We worked with a services engineer for a cooling and ventilation system to be as efficient as possible. So we've used a chilled beam design with air coming through in the floor. And we looked at the flexibility of this, um, where the chill beam layout could accommodate both an open plan layout and a cellular, more traditional office layout. So it still offers the flexibility without having to reconfigure the ceilings. 
also we looked at flexibility across the office where the office floor plates are served from the north and the south and the division between two tenants can very easily and flexibly be moved between the two this allows for um, the office to adapt and um, without using too much time effort and carbon to refurbish or change the division between two tenants we've also included for soft spots so that number of floors can be connected together and I suppose the final points I wanted to make really is how can we use timber more widely in construction if we're really serious about creating great internal environments and reducing carbon and finally just a reminder that we do have a FCBS carbon tool which is free to use and helps with those first initial design decisions that we might make and understand how they can have a difference in the, in the building. I think much of the profession has a very good understanding of well-being and operational carbon, but do we all really understand embodied carbon? So thank you very much and um, I look forward to any questions. I think it's really interesting to sort of talk about this um, balancing point in terms of carbon between having double and triple glazed windows because I think everyone always thinks oh you know the more the better um, how you've obviously come to a conclusion on this project but how will you advise clients on future projects who are saying well of course we want triple glazing will you say well think again it may not be the best option I think there is um it's actually a really interesting debate and um, alongside the extra pane of glass it also makes a difference on the type of window system you're using so if you've a building with windows as holes in wall um going to triple glazing might include more support structure uh, so uh, yeah it's a, it's a really interesting balance i think there is no one set answer which um was interest interesting for us to find out on this project and it also makes a difference on um, the form of your building. If you've got a, a cube or a square building, uh, there's not as much facade to floor area. Uh, so there's not as much heat loss through the facade. Whereas if you've got a long, thin building, you're more likely to need the triple glazing because the thermal performance through the wall is going to be more significant. Even though you'll also have more windows, won't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. More windows. So you'll need a better U value. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was also interested in the thing you said about having more opening windows and saying that you thought the shift to electric cars was really uh, going to make a difference because obviously you're not going to have petrol fumes and diesel fumes. I suppose one thing that's and interesting acoustic is acoustic as well on that one. Yeah. Because um, electric cars are quieter. Yes. Um, I suppose it's interesting because people were talking about this quite some time ago and saying, oh, we're all going to have opening windows in our cities with electric cars of course they were talking and it wasn't really happening but you feel we're really at a tipping point now for this do you i think there is a tipping point but it might be more on the scale of uh, you know five to ten years away but we hope this building is going to be there for a very long time so we've um i think it was very important to include the opening windows and mm -hmm. um there's such benefits for well-being and fresh air and post-COVID people really appreciate their access to outside air. And I suppose the last question is really um, you talked about the reasons why you felt that there should be a building here to do with its position in the city and the fact that the site had been built on. I just wondered how you would react if you went to a client and they wanted to build in a place where you didn't feel there should be a building there wasn't a strong environmental argument i mean do you first try to persuade them not to do a building and then what withdraw from the project and have someone else come in and do it or what it's a really hard question isn't it I, I think it is a really tricky question and we all have a responsibility um however i would say one of the first things we would do is if somebody comes to us and they have a, a site and it perhaps already has an existing building on it it would be really question whether that existing building can provide some of a program that they're looking for in their new building or whether it can be adapted and added to and upgraded to to meet the needs that they have rather than initial um clear reaction of knock down and start again <laughs>
I think in the industry we have to um, we do have quite a lot of refurbishment and reuse of buildings and that's going to mm -hmm. be a big way to save a lot of carbon. Before I introduce our next speaker, I just would like to remind our audience, do keep your questions coming in um, because we love to have them and we will use as many as we possibly can. And now it's time for our second presentation mm -hmm. and that's coming from Nick Cramp, who is a senior partner with the Light and Air team at Max Fordham. Nick. So, hi, I'm, I'm Nick. Um, specialist in environmental design and lighting from engineering partnership Max Fordham LLP, where we've been designing buildings to use less energy for longer than I've worked there, which is long enough. So I'm quite comfortable in saying that the battle to reduce our carbon emissions isn't the fight against the wider aims of good design, a form of happy, healthy, successful buildings which stand the test of time. This example um, on the slide is one of our long completed projects, sketches still hand drawn. Um, and it's the original building research establishment's low energy office before my day, but an early piece of low energy design we did with Alina's firm, Guild and Clegg Bradley as architects. I've had calls to revisit this work recently as we design its successor on the BRE campus with AHMM. I found many of the ideas there still pertinent to the modern day still needed, in some cases yet to be fully embraced by the building sector, especially the idea that generous, life-affirming natural light and plentiful fresh air can be balanced with an outstanding environmental performance. That's the theme I want to explore today. So this was my first building project as an engineer, LSO St Luke's in Old Street, balancing comfort and thermal and performance in visual, thermal, particularly as it's the home of the London Symphony Orchestra, acoustic terms with lower operating costs and less emissions. It was important as a guide to us then around the turn of the new century as it is now. I think we're getting better at it and we need to be much better still, but the still features of LSO St Luke's worth reviewing for a moment. The building used renewable energy for heating and cooling in the form of a closed loop geothermal system under the site. Uh, it's an early adopter of that technology, which isn't just zero emissions in use, but also extremely quiet. We wanted to make use of natural ventilation as well, but the acoustic standards are extremely strict. So the secret was to use very large lined duct roots and plenums, which because of their size have a low resistance to airflow as well as little or no regenerated noise. This means we could harness wind power up in the historic church bell tower to drive fresh air through the building, make use of the thermal mass in the form of exposed stonework, and only have to rely on forced ventilation for busy performances. Opening windows wouldn't have been any use because of the noise coming from, from the main road. So getting enough openings into the hall for this to work was tricky, but we carefully integrated them into acoustic walls and linings and left the bell tower open to above I'm happy to report it's an ongoing success, still working there. Uh, daylight was important too. The hall, shown on this slide, is primarily a working space where the orchestra need to concentrate, stay fresh, be aware of passing time so they're able to sleep well. So I think it was worth the investment in very thick, 50 millimeter, I think, secondary glazing that lets us keep all of the original windows, the views to the gardens outside and access to sunlight too. Move on to another challenging project now, the Musée d'Art de Nantes in France, uh, where we needed to meet the demands of museum spaces in which light exposure must be limited, fatigue for a noise managed within a historic fabric. I'll explain how we did that. So concerns about light damage saw many of the world's great galleries and museums block up all their windows and roof lights in the late part of the last century all over the world. Decision that I think was reactionary, impulsive, ultimately wasteful because it was impermanent. A large part of our business, Max Fordham's, is renovating these institutions, and putting the light back. This photo um, here, uh, before the project started, is the grand ley light in the middle of the Palais des Beaux-Arts, uh, connected to outside via a roof foil, which had been painted out, partly obscured, and lit up with artificial lights during the day. A little bit of sun still gets through at the edges, but what a waste. 
much better like this after the project restored, providing a free source of light and a focal point for orientating yourself around this big building. But lots of proven benefits to natural light and to fresh air and experiential qualities they bring, that vital sense of connection to outside and health and productivity gains too. There's a body of evidence for those values, um, of which I've reiterated a small amount here. And in this specific case, for this typology, the challenge of museum fatigue, or the absence of changeable light and views see people often become disorientated and tired, modeled by the lady sleeping on the bench there. So we had to address that, and we tried to do so holistically, answering the brief for light, air and sound together. We need to take a broad view, I think. The focus on CO2 emissions at the moment is hugely important, but we've only recently come to think very seriously about upfront emissions from construction embodied energy, as well as in use, and we're yet to wholeheartedly, as an industry, join the battle against waste and pollution in a wider sense, the battle against scarcity of materials, against the emissions of other greenhouse gases like methane, and perhaps most deadly of all, against dwindling fresh water supplies. So if we address only the, 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 the most current, the most topical issues, as museums did when, when blocking up all their openings a few decades ago, we were throwing things away again. It's better, I think, to do things right once. So the solution we came up with in Nantes was to replace the old painted out ley lights with a multi-layered top hat that filtered light, extracted air and absorbed sound at the same time. The lowest layer, which you can see in the photograph, is a double microperforated and translucent membrane, subtly diffuses and attenuates natural light. And it has tiny holes, which are too small to see, that trap air, so absorb mid to high frequency noise. Low frequency noise passes through, and beyond is a, is a lined box that you can see some of here um, in these photos I took during the construction project. Um, in total, there are two membrane layers, one to catch the dust, one to absorb the sound, a perforate lining for low frequency noise, acid etched glass um, has been installed in the photograph that scatters the direct sun and a roof void uh, with blinds that work to adjust light levels as required by the conservation target. And here's the result. Clean reductive spaces that are filled with a gently varying light and invisibly managed acoustics. Here's another example from our team's portfolio. A good one, I hope. Um, it's about doing as little as possible, substituting radical change with a deeper understanding of what we already have. It's the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Galleries at, at Westminster Abbey. Um, the Abbey has a, has a vast and varied collection of historic artifacts recovered from all corners of the globe over the last thousand years or so. So they need to display them. But the large and elegant space they had above the main body of the cathedral, you can see in the picture here, wasn't usable in the past because of all the windows and all of the light was uncontrolled. Strong sunlight gets everywhere in the Abbey sometimes and the heat gains and air paths are, are really complex too. In what is an open plan building, hundreds of windows, thousands of different surfaces and tens of thousands of leaky junctions. So we needed to look at the overall effect of what happens in the ongoing life of the Abbey, rather than what we can just see or feel in a particular moment. That's called cumulative analysis, and as well as the three dimensions of geometry, it solves the fourth dimension of time. So here we go. It took three min months or so, running up to 80 remote servers, probably not on a renewable tariff, but it should have been, um, in order to process every ray of bouncing light and study the pressure field caused by the wind too. The result, as you can see here, an extremely detailed map of the internal environment iterated over a whole year, which the exhibition planners, MUMA, could carefully and precisely plan a display of, of, of different objects around. We applied films to the existing windows to manage the light levels. And most exhibits were placed in cases to stabilize their environment, either passively or actively. Uh, but by and large, this whole space is naturally lit, and naturally ventilated, requiring very little intervention. And consequently, it delivers very low embodied and operational carbon footprints in the final project. Here it is. 
and one more. My conclusion from this case study is that the existing building stock that we have is adaptable if we want it to be. It's not always easy. I have another example now of how we can understand more and do less. Again, it's a much loved institution with a global presence, but in this case, a mixed reuse um, of the existing switch house at Tate Modern and the new construction. Most, if not all, international standard art galleries are air conditioned, but actually only a small fraction requires close control of temperature and humidity. It's generally the temporary or the lone gallery. And we work with the Tate over a number of years, several projects to help them redefine their design conditions so that their collection, the collection that they own, requires only broad control. And of course, people, visitors, much less fragile. In conclusion, we found that only 25% of the project needed air conditioning. So we could go and design a naturally ventilated, and naturally lit new building. But managing natural ventilation is challenging in, in larger, more complicated buildings. Air will always take the path of least resistance. So they're very affected by the interconnectivity between spaces, as well as wind driven pressure field over the, the whole of the building. So let's say a window in the middle of an elevation connected to another on the other side, for example, might be an appealing low resistance path, but one at the edge may be very much more difficult for the air to pass through than simply flowing around the outside of the building. Not only that, the whole of the, uh, of the Tate switch house, now called the Blavatnik building, is interconnected through a grand central staircase and a bridge through the turbine hall into the original museum. So it all adds to the complexity. And thus, uh, a lot of simulation analysis was, was, was needed using computational fluid dynamics, digital wind tunnels, uh, dynamic thermal models, and, and the resultant installation did require a complicated control system that understands all the interdependencies of the hundreds of automatically controlled windows, but it works throughout the year. Could, could, it could easily accommodate the our changing needs for abundant fresh air during the pandemic, and it demands very little active plant and energy. Here's a picture of filtered daylight to one of the galleries. So staying in the realm of, of cultural buildings, which I'm, I'm mostly doing today, I want to show you uh, one more example, which is a new build project, describes what we've learned from her uh, in finding that perfect environmental balance. It's Maxi in Rome, um, which opened in 2010, and the architect was uh, Zaha Hadid. Um, the ambition was always to use natural light for all the benefits that I, I described a few moments ago. But we had to look in detail at thermal performance and comfort to make sure our design was something the gallery could live with in, in the hot Roman summer in particular. And we found that the savings achieved by strictly filtering out all of the sunlight were very large because they kept the gallery cool. Several layers of filtration were designed into the roof openings. And here we go. That cool, diffuse natural light, north light, looks good for large installations. But it, it does lack the warmth, the more characterful art lighting. So we also had to include warm key light from, from that chandelier in this case and cool backlight coming from the roof lights. If you mix that with some neutral light from the linear strip as well, then you get that three point lighting uh, that's so desirable. And whereas having lights on in the daytime may seem counterintuitive for minimizing energy use, our studies showed that prioritizing low heat gains was the most important factor in reducing emissions. Natural light, fresh air too, both have undeniable benefits and well-being, but you must manage them well or risk the occupants doing so themselves by their own inelegant means. So Zaha Hadid Associates, Maxi's architect, like all good architects, uh, are now exploring new materials for construction in order to lessen their carbon footprints. And this is a project, uh, an exemplar of that, that we're doing with them right now. It's Forest Green Rovers Football Stadium. So it's, it's a modular timber, timber construction, a permeable envelope, not just light filled, but lightweight too, which saves on foundations. Buildings that ventilate themselves, light themselves and support themselves, produce much lower upfront emissions. And by way of summation, uh, as I get to the end, I'm going to show a few studies that we did for an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in New York a few years back. I think it's interesting to see how years of learning, of experimentation, of trial and error has produced typologies for these simple temporary buildings, which are highly optimised for light, sound and air. So the first example here 
these uh, are Bedouin tents, mostly the Arabian Peninsula. And they've lots of clever features we could see the effects of when we studied them with computational fluid dynamics and in our solar energy simulations as well. All of these various openings at the front and the back work with their adjacencies to outside around the edge. They're smaller in the middle, they're bigger. About where the kitchen is and, and warm air is exhausted with the internal divisions that, that make up the space to produce, and you can see this on the left, remarkably consistent airflow patterns that calm the wind enough to drop any sand out of it, but still keep everywhere fresh. And the play of light's very successful too. I mean, it really shows us how important the positioning of windows is on a building, that you have to work quite hard to find the perfect design. This is completely different uh, from a different nomadic group in the Sahara in Africa. Um, here, the raised upper section, this is a, a Tureg tent, traps hot air, and the opening under the roof allows uninterrupted ventilation to the occupied zone below it. You know, we can use these ideas, and I think that speaks to my suggestion that environmental design shouldn't reject our architectural heritage. Up. We should learn from the past um, and what's been created already and, and, and reuse or, or, or at least be inspired by it. There's one more group of nomadic tents we studied from the plains of East Africa, Kenya specifically. Um, these Rendili tents are extraordinary. They're covered in animal fur, which you can see at the top there, which is hydroscopic. So it absorbs the moisture in the air and inside the tents at night when people are sleeping, creating a more comfortable environment. When the sun then hits those fibers in the daytime, that moisture evaporates um, and that cools the structure. Hidden openings, all you can't see them, but they're all around, provide the right amount of ventilation through thin slots, which are resistant to higher winds. It's brilliant. The only thing I couldn't figure out was why the doorway was so small. That didn't seem to confer any particular benefit in light and air terms. Then I found out that makes it lion-proof, which is important too. And that's my final remark. Thank you. Lots to learn from those tents, although I'm guessing with most of the projects you're doing, uh, you don't need to make them lion proof. Although, of course, when you look at projects like Maxi, I think um, Rome is now overrun with wild boar, isn't it? So there may be a lesson there. Um, in terms of taking lessons from one place to another, um, we've had a question come in about what aspects of the approach you've taken at museums could be used in large office spaces. Well, I think um, what I'm trying to advocate is it's careful and thorough study of, of the parameters of any building. Um, we work in very demanding uh, uh, environments um, which allow the space for that kind of study, but I think it applies across all typologies. Um, I think in large office buildings, the challenge is natural ventilation. As a building gets larger, the, uh, the flow of air gets more complicated. I think the, 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 the very involved computer-based studies um, and, and testing on site validation that we've done on these museum projects is directly applicable um, to, to having that more passive approach to uh, office buildings as well. Someone's asked about lighting and said, what is the desirable three point lighting that you've referred to? Can you explain this a bit more? And I have to say, I'm also interested in mm -hmm. this idea that um, having a greater amount of artificial lighting is actually energy efficient. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, we've been cross-pollinated from different industries there and three-point lighting is a, is a common strategy in, in, in film and photography um, where there's a light behind uh, uh, the, a person or, or, the, or the subject of, of your view uh, that forms an outline and gives a sense of depth. In the real world, that's the sky. The, the, the sky has that function. There's also um, fill light, uh, which um, Leonardo da Vinci, rather elegantly called fumato, the, the smokiness that hangs in the room. That's the scattered light that fills in shadows. Uh, and key light is, let, so let's say that's a, a cloudy sky or even the environment, all the light reflecting off the environment. Um, and finally, the third of those three points is key light, uh, which, is, which is a strong shadow, uh, shadowy light that, that casts um, a shadow uh, and is distinct um, and brings a bit of character. Um, so that might be the direct sun, for example, if, if we're working with uh, the natural world or, or it could be a spotlight. Um, so with those three points, we get 
characterfulness from key light, we get detail from fill light, and we get depth from, from backlight. So with those three components, and they can be natural, they can be the, sky, the sun, the sky, the, the environment around us, uh, we get a complete lighting scheme. Um, now, the second of your point, which I thought was a very interesting one, is the notion that lights on isn't necessarily uh, a wasteful um, energy strategy compared to, to having windows. The reality is that the, the window does more than, um, than than just bring in light. And actually, its benefits in, in human terms, I think, are the connection to outside, the, the experiential um, feeling and, and uh, physiological benefits of changing light or, or variation in, in tone and direction over the course of the day. Um, in fact, a window uses quite a lot of embodied energy, as Alina explained. In fact, it does let out more heat than a wall in, in the winter. In fact, it, it causes heating in the summer too. So actually, when you analyze deep, deeply those, uh, th those flows of energy compared to hyper-efficient modern LED lighting, it's often the, it's often the artificial lighting that, that comes out the, the low en lowest energy choice. But of course, it has none of those benefits conferred by the the connection to outside. So I do see a future where both are, are, are key tools um, in, in getting the right strategy. I mean, one thing that occurred to me, if you can just see if you can do this quickly, is I thought it was really interesting um, that you talked about the mistakes that were made in museum design in the end of the last century. And it's always really easy with hindsight to see what those are. I just wondered if you see similar mistakes that we are in danger of making today. Well I, well, I think there there are some. Um, I think uh, we, we're, we're probably more enlightened. Well, we certainly are more enlightened at, at this moment and approaching our designs as collectively than, um, than than we were five years ago. And of course, those are the buildings being built. Um, and one only has to look at the finalists in the Sterling Prize uh, recently mm -hmm. to see that uh, embodied energy is largely ignored. Um, so. I do think that, that at the moment we are building buildings which are, are creating too much upfront emissions um, and, and often those buildings have been designed and maybe they've been conceived and, uh, and developed over a decade um, uh, and are coming to be built now and I, I think that's wrong. I think it's very difficult to, to halt projects but we're certainly building buildings that are full of steel and concrete that have enormous spans yeah. and cantilevers um, that are very damaging to the planet and they were built with good intentions. Um, to serve a need, to serve what, what, what we perceived as a, the best choices at the time. So, yeah, I do see some, some of those mistakes happening now, and I think they mostly concern emissions, upfront emissions, um, that they're only becoming conscious of now. I think uh, a few years ago, and I was guilty of any, everyone advocating exposed concrete soffits. Um, yeah. With the great benefits that, that, they, that they bring in. In, in cooling in, in the summertime when associated with natural ventilation. But actually concrete is, is a hugely polluting material. And, um, uh, and other choices, I think, are, are, are looking wiser now. We'll have a chance to talk again at the end. Um, before I introduce our final speaker, just a reminder, do keep your questions coming in, please. Um, but I'm delighted now to introduce Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, who is Director of the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge. Sean, over to you. Hello. I thought it would be a topical thing to talk today about COVID and the climate, or actually in terms of the longer title and the bigger exposition, is why improved ventilation is actually synergistic with, rather than in opposition to, progress in energy efficiency in the built environment. So I thought it would be very helpful to first of all look at where we are today in terms of emissions forecasts and the role of the built environment. So this is a chart uh, that's been circulating for about 18 months and it's sobering reading uh, in that if you look at the global carbon dioxide emissions, the business as usual trajectory really says there isn't going to be much of a change, so pretty much plateauing. Uh, admittedly, it's not going up as hard as it was in the previous decades, but it's really not pretty when especially we need to get to a net zero position by at least 2050. And arguably, because of the state of the climate right now, we should be going even harder than that. Um, so what can we do 
about this, about the emissions that we need to sort of reduce in light of the fact that we also have this horrible thing that's emerged over the last 18 months, namely COVID. Well, <clears throat> the role of the buildings in the energy consumption globally is rather large. Um, and the chart on the left, the pink bit is basically just showing you what the current uh, percentage of buildings, uh, its responsibility for emissions, and then under the three different scenarios by 2050. The chart on the right is the one that probably scares me most. Uh, and in fact, the very far right hand bar. The far right hand bar shows that the percentage growth in emissions is going to be largest in, under a business as usual scenario from buildings. So buildings have got this massive responsibility for the future of the climate. We've got to address this in a, in a, in a way. And yet we're now thinking that, gosh, well, how can we do this in light of the fact that we're going to be needing to provide more air into buildings than perhaps uh, we have done so previously. And the reason we've got to provide more air is as a result of COVID-19. So this is some words taken from the uh, World Health Organization. Um, and it was the sort of the, they were the first uh, rec organization to then recognize that the route of transmission of COVID, it wasn't just hands, it wasn't just the face and droplets. Actually, it was to do with these, the smaller particles uh, emanating from someone's airway and then circulating within the space. And the way to really sort this out is to increase the level of ventilation uh, in indoor spaces in order to reduce the buildup of concentration of virus particles that might be circulating if you're in the presence of an infectious person or infectious persons. So the World Health Organization stepped forward. <clears throat> and then what else happened? Well, what else happened was that uh, the UK government uh, had been banging the drum as well. And this was through SAGE and through the SAGE Environmental Modeling Group. And it was adopted in terms of statements uh, for example, by the UK Health and Security Agency, saying, look, we've got to uh, improve our uh, level of ventilation of indoor spaces in order to stop the spread of coronavirus. And if we especially look back to last winter, this was the, um, the late autumn of, um, of 2020, going into the uh, early, early months of 2021, we all remember just how how sort of horrible that was in terms of having to be isolating from families and things, especially over the Christmas period. We've got to go and make sure that we improve the interior environment by getting air, space, air being ventilated through the spaces. And then furthermore, um, I was involved in uh, supporting uh, the industry. So this was the uh, SIBSI, the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, and they issued a number of documents uh, along, along the line term emerging from lockdown and one of those was indeed uh, based on ventilation really really important to try and increase the level of ventilation and why do we think it's important to increase the level of ventilation well first of all i don't want us all to think that we need to be uh, blasting every space that we are in with cold air because it's a law of diminishing returns and this page taken from the government website is really rather helpful if you see i've circulated in red and it says what we really need to identify are poorly ventilated areas. They're the ones that need to be addressed. It isn't the ones that are well ventilated and then making them even better. Oh, if you can without sort of big penalties, fine, let's do that. But the real, real return in terms of effort is going to be on identifying the poorly ventilated spaces and then addressing those. That's how we're going to get the biggest impact in terms of um, COVID management going forward and indeed other respiratory diseases as well that might come uh, come and hit us in the future and this is uh, some data that i took some time ago but it's really really interesting the statement um, in the current guidelines um, are that multi-occupant spaces that are used regularly and, and are poorly ventilated and by poorly ventilated we mean above 1500 parts per million of co2 uh, consistently these should be identified and prioritized for improvement why uh, do we think they sh they are going to be uh, these spaces are going to exist? Well, this is two weeks of data from a school um, that had a controlled ventilation system installed, and the controlled ventilation system it was in the roof and was triggered by temperature and importantly a CO two sensor on the wall, and we turned it on because uh, we were sort of trying to understand occupant behaviour. We turned it on on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we turned it off 
on Tuesday and Thursday. So if you look at what people then do when the system is off, basically the CO2 levels just go jack high. And what this is demonstrating is that in, this is a sort of a, a, not a Victorian classroom, it, this classroom would have been built around the 1960s, 1970s. And what it's showing is that in order to try and keep, keep the space thermally comfortable, the windows are not being opened. The heating system's on, the insulation isn't great, therefore we've got to try and keep the space reasonably warm. And the penalty is that these spaces are inadequately ventilated. You've got CO2 levels on these days when it's not being triggered by an automated system of CO2 levels going above 1,500 parts per million. So this, this is the evidence that actually spaces are going to be inadequately ventilated in many cases, unless we get them properly designed, properly retrofitted, um, and actually maybe trigger points to suggest to people that we need to be bringing some level of ventilation in. And one of the best ways of doing this um, are to use controlled ventilation systems that don't necessarily do everything for all of the year, but they get you out of a hole um, in, the, in the problem times. And the problem times in the UK are typically the depth of winter. So these are two examples. Uh, on the left-hand side is a mechanical ventilation heat recovery unit. This one happens to be uh, manufactured by Ventaxia. And the bottom uh, right is a, another form of a controlled ventilation system. It doesn't do heat recovery, it does heat recycling. So it in, um, basically mixes the incoming cold air in winter with enough of the warm room air to ameliorate, ameliorate the cold drafts. But the principle of behind both of these are that we're using the heat gains within a space to try and manage the temperature and certainly cure the cold drafts. And therein is a really, really important point in that we're not using radiators or heating elements to cure a cold draft. Both of these uh, sorts of ventilation systems are using the heat gains, namely from people, IT lights, and maybe even a bit of solar, um, to actually go and bring the temperature of the space, bring the temperature of the air up in the first place. And then the heating is only needed when, frankly, the heat gains in the space are insufficient to maintain an ambient of, say, 21 degrees centigrade. So it's possible, therefore, to have improved ventilation, especially in the winter, in other words, it's addressing the inadequately ventilated times, and it's in the winter when people are going to not be as uh, ready to open the windows. Having these sorts of ventilation systems in place, which are controlled with a CO2 sensor, will actually allow the spaces to be adequately ventilated. And in fact, if you've done some building work to put these sorts of systems in, then it's very likely that we've actually addressed the environment and the fabric of, of the building as well, and therefore made the building better insulated. So we're not leaking as much heat through conduction, and we're allowing the heat gains in the space to actually manage the air temperatures. So it is possible to therefore have better ventilated spaces when you've got these sorts of devices for the winter period. And in the summer period, you can either continue to use mechanical ventilation, I would be one to greatly support actually using opening windows uh, if you possibly can when it's warmer outside. So here's some data. Uh, this is a, a school in Nottinghamshire and it had one of these um, kind of controlled ventilation systems in place. And because it was controlled by CO2, uh, it was monitored over actually a number of years. But this is a, a showing, um, showing a winter period where the CO2 level just never exceeds 1500 parts per million. The daily average never exceeded 1500 parts per million. That's what it was controlled to do. And you could walk into these uh, classrooms. There are 30 children in a 60 square meter place. You can do this. You can get spaces that are well ventilated without cold drafts. And the most important thing is that we can demonstrate that we can provide controlled ventilation and air quality. What does it do about the energy? And this is data from, from a couple of schools actually, showing that uh, you can actually get low energy schools. So these are the two bars on the right hand side, the green bars, much lower than the typical practice or good practice back then from the SIBSI guides. And this was as a result of in making not only the building fabric reasonably well uh, insulated, but most importantly, the ventilation strategy being used so that we weren't having heating elements, heating batteries or radiators to preheat the air in the winter. We were using the heat gains from people, IT lights and solar to do the job for us. So absolutely you can do this. And then going forwards, um, it is most likely that buildings of the future are going to not just use mechanical ventilation. They're not just going to use natural ventilation. They're going to use a combination of the two. And this is a well-publicized uh, building 
Um, this is the Apple headquarters in Cupertino. You can find some details on the internet, but this is an example of a hybrid building. Basically, uh, it's in the South, um, the South San Francisco Bay area. And then on many, many days, the building will be ventilating naturally uh, with, the, with the dampers being opened and controlled on CO2 and temperature sensors. But when it gets particularly either hot or very cold outside, uh, then the building can close up and use mechanical ventilation, heat recovery in order to therefore not have lots of cooling and lots and lots of uh, energy being expended that way, doing heat recovery in cooling mode, as well as, of course, heat recovery in heating mode as well. So these kinds of buildings we're going to see more of. That's one in, uh, in the United States. This one is in, one in London, close to home. This is the Bloomberg headquarters, and it won the Reba Sterling Prize as a result of the Energy Efficiency and the Sustainability Awards. We are able to provide well-ventilated spaces that are very low energy by getting things right. So in summary, um, I wanted to uh, sort of re really emphasize the fact that controlled ventilation is necessary in order to avoid poorly ventilated spaces. They're the Achilles heel that we need to address for COVID. Hybrid is often going to be best. And what do we mean by improved quality? I will assert that we will, by improved quality, we mean increased levels of ventilation uh, from the minimum. That doesn't mean blasting with lots and lots of air. It's bringing up that minimum to address the inadequately ventilated spaces and reduced energy. And why are we doing this? We're doing this to address this initial picture that I share with you is to reduce that pink bucket and therefore get the built environment helping climate change, but also helping health. Thanks very much. As somebody who has sort of sat in one or two restaurants where all the doors were open <clears throat> on cold days, I'm glad to hear we don't have to blast cold air through everywhere. Um, as one of the questions we've had says, new schools are exemplary, but what's the best compromise for adapting the existing aging schools to improve their heating and ventilation? So it's a really important question, actually addressing the existing building stock. Um, from an energy efficiency point of view, um, it is important that we sort out the fabric. Uh, so a lot of, lots of these buildings uh, will lose heat. And it's, if they're losing heat as a result of air leaving and therefore being associated with ventilation for health purposes, I wouldn't be as concerned uh, during the occupied day. But what concerns me is that quite a lot of the heat is being lost through conduction. And therefore that heat is really just not doing anything for you. So we've got to make sure that we improve the fabric. And then once you've improved the fabric, so fabric first, we then want to ensure that we've got controlled ventilation. So it does require some expenditure on, on some of the existing buildings. Sort out the fabric to reduce conductive losses, radiative losses perhaps as well. But then once we've done that, you then need to ensure that you've got adequate ventilation and ideally controlled ventilation. And interestingly, if you have controlled ventilation uh, and you've only got any thermal mass in the space, you're going to reduce your preheat requirements as well. So getting controlled ventilation is particularly important for the UK climate. And you talk about a lot about um, heating schools in the winter. Um, I'm wondering as well about ventilation and cooling in the summer. I mean, you talked about your preference being opening windows. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree with you. I'm just worrying as uh, we start getting hotter and hotter summers, uh, how much of that is going to be practical or are we going to need a very different approach? Well, uh, a really important question. So, I mean, Nick will know this as many other engineers as well, that we design buildings, not just on today's weather files, but future weather files and trying to think about the cooling requirements going forwards. And um, certainly outside of the major metropolis areas like London, uh, it is possible to still get night cooling to work because the temperatures do come down at night. And therefore, if you have thermally massive buildings, it can provide um, a way of providing natural cooling uh, when, you've, when you've done night cooling. The, the challenge is in, some, in the middle of London, where the nighttime temperatures, as a result of all of the concrete being there, where it doesn't come down. So in those particular areas, Ruth, I do think there is a that there we're going to need to think pretty hard about whether purely naturally ventilated buildings for the peak of the summer are appropriate or whether we need to supplement those with some mechanical cooling. It's a big question, uh, and therefore with the schools, obviously you've got six weeks of out out time during the the height of the summer, but nevertheless it's still going to become an increasing problem. That high thermal mass is so often with that. Uh exposed concrete, which as Nick was saying, uh, we're seeing is more and more of a problem now. Um, I wonder how much we can do with perception as well. <clears throat> I can't remember where it was, but I saw um, some something recently which said that um, 
adults were much more re uh, sensitive to cold than children. And um, that one of the problems was that the teachers kept shutting the windows in the classrooms and they were cold, even though the kids weren't cold at all. So maybe we're going to have to um, all invest in some cardigans or something for teachers. Uh, anyway, I think we're now at the point <coughs> where I would like to invite our other speakers to um, come back in and we will look at some more general questions as well as some of the questions that have come in. And one of the questions is, could the speakers address possible strategies of incorporating living elements and biophilia as part of the embodied carbon and filtering of air? Things like moss walls, wormeries, composting and so soil biomes, etc. I mean, I think we are at a point, aren't we, where um, stuff which was seen as being a sort of little nice add-on is actually being seen as quite seriously important. Um, Alina, I don't know if you'd be looking at this in your projects. Um, so the um, input of biophilia, I think, is actually something that's really interesting and um, will become more necessary. I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, one of the things that we were trying to incorporate the possibility of in the Three Chamberlain Square um, case study I talked through earlier, I, with the access to external spaces, external spaces which could have plants growing on them that could um, form not just a, a visual and attractive green area, filter some of the potential pollutants and improve the air quality. Um, so I think there is a role, there's definitely a role for biophilia in the future of buildings. And I know, Nick, um, obviously you are the man who's been doing a lot of very uh, extensive modelling. I mean, that's why I think those tents were so interesting is because you were modelling everything that happened, certainly in a way that wasn't modelled when they were designed. So I guess they're just reproduced by trial and error. But with the detailed modelling you're doing and you've been telling us how complex a lot of big spaces are as well, um, how much have you actually looked at uh, the impact of plants and living things beyond the feel good factor, which I know in itself is very important. It is. So actually, this is something that we've studied and researched. So we did a research project with UCL about that. Um, and if you look on the research and innovation uh, part of our website, Max Fordham's, you can uh, see a write up of that research called Greening Cities, um, when we've looked specifically at the benefits um, for London in uh, air quality terms, um, in, in human terms, human health terms. Um, the, a dose of realism is required. Um, we're talking about bulk air movement uh, um, to manage temperature and carbon dioxide levels in buildings. And the effect of a small amount of planting is subtle. The most immediate, most obvious benefits are to our, our, our health um, in, in terms of uh, the psychological benefit of, 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 of the living world. Um, in terms of air purification, well, we think about forests, about enormous um, ecosystems and, and not about window boxes. Um, if we're serious uh, about gains there, we have to be really committed and ambitious to this. Uh, small moves uh, uh, don't have a, a measurable effect in, 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 let's say, acoustic terms as well. We also studied that. Um, I urge, uh, I, I, I'm absolutely clear about the, uh, the health benefits. So we should do this, even if we can only do it in, in a small way. But to really get those benefits, those ambitious benefits of, of purer air, we need to go big, really, really big, cover the whole site in, in, in as much greenery as possible, inside and outside. We, we've got to push this to get um, to get quantitative returns. Sean, you're nodding. Do you have anything to add to this? Um, look, just to echo Nick's, uh, Nick's thoughts, I, I have looked at some uh, buildings as well. Uh, where we've actually looked at beyond the building, in other words, the immediate landscape and actually the, the effects of that. The one thing that uh, with with planting that you can get uh, as a result of mo is moisture, uh, in other words, to keep that growing. And actually some of the evaporative cooling effects from moisture um, is something that is worth considering. But just Nick said is absolutely bang on. You know, you've got to go large if you're going to get measurable benefits from in terms of physical parameters. Therefore, I think the bigger benefits are to do with human connectivity to the outside world, living spaces, and actually the psychological and the well-being, sense of well-being. There's a question here, um, which I think is probably mostly for Alina. Um, someone saying, well, with large office floor plates and a high population, 
how do you get people to all agree on when to open the windows? Um, and I think it may be something that's relevant in other projects as well, that, you know, what suits one person doesn't suit another. And actually we have to understand human behavior as much as we have to understand things like uh, fluid dynamics. Mm, yeah, um, how people behave in buildings and how they uh, use them is a really critical factor. And as we, we know, that can make a really big difference to the operational energy used. Um, so one of the ways to help mitigate this, I don't think you're ever going to get rid of the fact that everyone is different and different environmental conditions will suit different people um, is so there's a uh, try to create a range of different types of spaces throughout the office. And then um, the people who like that draft by the window and there are lots of people who that's comfortable for them I'm more of a snuggy person um you you organize your office so that there's a variety of spaces and you locate people where they're going to feel most comfortable so that's one factor also um in the office um environment uh, allowing people to dress and adapt themselves to the different environments so rather than i mean hopefully gone are the days of very strict dress code in offices um but i think some flexibility as you mentioned earlier the extra cardigan or um providing chilled water or you know diff different factors like that can help everyone feel most comfortable um in the variation across the office we have had projects where there have been um smart building systems where people get to kind of vote on um, window open, window closed situation. But um, I'm, I'm not sure that's fully the answer. If you take an average of everybody, whoever votes the most might win out. So um, it is a tricky problem. And I think variety and flexibility are part of the ways to answer that. Yes, I think the problem with a voting system is, you know, if you're in the minority, especially if it's a sizable minority and you keep losing, yeah. you know, it may be democratic in one sense, but if you actually spend but the day... But it can be quite frustrating. Yeah, you spend the day being always too hot or too cold. It's not great. Um, I suppose another thing that comes up from that is, and I'm going to address this to Nick because I think it's where it, who it came to initially, is the question of post-occupancy evaluation. And I think that was, uh, the question was whether or not you're actually using it on uh, your museum buildings. Um, but I'd love to know that. And in a wider sense, uh, picking up things that each of you have been learning from post-occupancy evaluation, or even if you're not using it because you can't, uh, tell us why, Nick. Well, yes, we, we certainly are where, where we can. Um, so, for example, we're doing extensive post-occupancy evaluation at the South Bank Centre, the Hayward Gallery, um, as well as the associated uh, buildings like the Royal Festival Hall. Um, we're also doing, we also have been doing that at the Tate, or all four Tates, in fact, um, and not just Tate Modern. Uh, and we learn a great deal. Um, now, actually, trying to, trying to combine that with the, with the earlier question of, of user control of ventilation. Um, what we have learned from, from following buildings is quite interesting. Well-designed systems, and I think Sean was talking about a, a form of automatic control that is very effective, carbon dioxide monitoring, temperature monitoring. It's really essential in bigger bu buildings, because if you open a window, it has unforeseen effects somewhere else in the building. You, you, you change the, the relationship uh, from inside to outside, you change the, the, the path of least resistance that I mentioned in my talk. Um, so actually, somebody opening a window isn't, isn't just a personal choice, it has an effect uh, downstream. Um, and what we have learned is that well-designed buildings where, where noise uh, and, and, and temperature and, and uh, concentrations of atmosphere are well managed require less of a dispute about what should we do and a bit of user control, the odd window that you might be able to open. Um, that makes you feel that you have mastery of the of the situation um, is very is very effective in satisfying people whilst at the same time using the benefit of our understanding and our technology to make sure that, that good conditions are maintained and we find this out in post occupancy evaluation because when the windows aren't working well people are very uh, dissatisfied and these kind of disputes emerge um, and, and this post occupancy evaluation teaches us to go into those control systems and refine them. Um, we make 
all sorts of assumptions about how buildings work, whether they're cultural buildings or, or, or commercial buildings, uh, that are entirely wrong because we can't see into the future um, once the building is in use. And actually, and in particular, uh, um, air systems need to be retuned to the to the real life of, of, of the building once it's complete uh, and once it um, is in everyday occupation. Um, and in doing that, you remove this this contest between user control and, uh, and an effective environment for everybody. I'm going to go on to Sean now. Um, and obviously, I think a lot of the work you have been doing has been post-occupancy evaluation, but I'm just interested in what you can learn from these things. And um, also, we've had a question, and I think this is really interesting, that says um, modern teaching practices, um, you know, certainly in the early years, use outdoor spaces as classrooms across all seasons, um, which leads to classroom doors being open all the time during the school day. Can heat gain be used to avoid drafts in such situations? I mean, I guess the answer is no. If you're going to have the doors open all day, uh, the cold air is coming in. I, I suppose the answer must be designing the building so it doesn't penetrate at least beyond that classroom. But I don't know what you've got to say about that. I mean, you're, you're completely right, Ruth, that if you leave the doors open on a ground floor classroom with early years, so reception year one, um, you know, the cold air is going to come in, right? Unless there's a wind blowing and it's the other way. But look, in all, in, yeah, yeah. invariably, the, the, air is going, the, the cold air is going to come in. And the critical thing is, to, therefore, to try and isolate that classroom and make sure you, then you don't have the linkages with other other rooms, as Nick alluded to, that the more complicated the typology of the building, then generally speaking, the more controlled the system needs to be. I'm not saying fully controlled because you still want to give people some opening windows uh, to give them a sense of control over their very local domain, but it must be limited so that you don't mess up the rest of the building. That's critical. Uh, but for a single classroom, um, the principle of using the heat gains in the space is, I think, important thinking about energy efficiency. And the way to do that is generally uh, if you can bring the air in at a high level, if, and this is a mechanical ventilation system, if you're going to bring the air in naturally, you want to bring it in at high level so that it's got a chance to mix with the air already in the space. That is not avail uh, available if you've got, you know, bifolding doors and they're completely open in the winter. So whilst those doors are open, you know, it's going to be, I can't use the heat gains in the space to ameliorate cold drafts. I think another thing that's been very interesting, I mean, we talked about that thing about artificial, you know, artificial lighting actually being a good energy um, solution in, in some buildings. I mean, we've talked about um, that idea of um, double glazed windows often being a better solution in terms of embodied carbon than triple glazed windows. Um, and I, again, you know, going back to those tents that Nick showed us, which were fascinating when he analysed them. But of course, um, the reason they work is because they have got probably centuries, certainly decades of trial and error and people keep reproducing the same thing again, knowing it works, even though they don't know exactly why it works. Um, I wonder where all this sort of calculation, it, you feel Alina, this is who I'm coming to, is actually placing you as an architect, because it seems to me that there are an awful lot of things where you can't just set out and do your design using your gut feeling because frankly your gut feeling is wrong and I just wonder how you feel about that and how how this is changing the way that you work. Actually I think it's really important that um, we work with a team of people we work with um, other consultants and in each project you might have a gut reaction of how you you'd think you'd like it to uh, perform and work out but you listen to the rest of the team around you um, and mm -hmm. it's okay to adapt and change t um, with their experience and so work together I think is the answer on that um, and then just going back on the POE point from before we do do yes. and have done a lot of um, POE particularly on schools um, and that's um, always been very interesting and feeding feeding that back and particularly to the sort of the typical classroom environment and um, 
actually links in with many of the things that Sean has just said about ventilation and windows and um, occupant control. Um, so all of those things we try to feed back in. And again, as an industry, I think it would be quite good if, if a lot more of that POE was more publicly available from everybody so that we can all learn from lessons um, as the environment changes, as the designing context changes, as um, we all understand more about embodied carbon as well as operational carbon. Um, there's quite a lot of shifting criteria here. Um, if we're going to really reduce carbon, we all need to work together. A question that's come in which says, I'm delighted to hear from Nick Cramp that natural light is back in museums and galleries, but would be interested to know how past fears about UV degradation of exhibits have been overcome. It, it, specifically, UV is relatively easy to manage. Um, so, for example, um, in, in laminate glass, which, which most museums would have, um, generally museums aren't full of uh, picture windows um, or, or galleries because you just look out the window, you know, it would be bright and interesting and you know, detract from the, the, the curatorial experience. There tends to be roof lights and they tend to be quite large, um, in which case they're probably made of laminated glass for safety. Uh, and the PCB uh, uh, interlayers in laminate glass are very, very effective at, at filtering out you know 99 percent or more of uv light um if if it's not laminate glass um it's quite easy to get films uh which can be applied to the glass and, and can, can filter out the uv too so uh we also have devices that measure uv uh, uh, within buildings so we can we can go into the existing building stock identify a problem and put up a film uh, and neutral films you, you wouldn't see them you wouldn't know they're there in fact it's a real difficulty for us when we're surveying in, in, existing <laughs> museum buildings to work out if there is a film on the glass we have to look at the edges look for tiny little um, uh, cracks and, uh, and peeling elements to, to, just to know it's there so it's quite easy to address UV that the, the, actually UV is just a wavelength of light and really the reactions that are occurring on the surface of, of these works um, are, are no different in the, in the UV spectrum as they are in the visible one. We can't keep out visible light. But what we can do is manage it to, to appropriate levels. Um, now, that does not mean that we're not damaging things. It means that we are arresting the damage of, of, of all of those exhibits to what, what we've decided is an acceptable extent. extent um, and, and every so often, they, they might need uh, conservation work. Um, so that's how we're managing UV and light. We're managing UV quite easily. Um, and, and more, more challenging is, is ma managing the broader spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, which we are doing by study, um, uh, by research, done, excellent research done in the uh, in the 90s at the National Gallery um, on, on the fading uh, under light, natural light of of, um, of artworks and paintings in particular, uh, to set ourselves targets, internationally acceptable targets, and uh, and filter the incoming light accordingly. I know there are places where things are incredibly sensitive where you know you go in and um there's a sort of curtain over something and you just pull it back and have a look at it and i think the vna have a carpet that they will only expose for half an hour a day or something um but i, th I think one of the things that you um brought up was that you said that some of the very highest standards of control not just of light but of everything are only needed in part of a building you know you talked about Tate Modern and you said well only part of it is going to be a traveling exhibition and a lot of the rest of it can cope with less stringent circumstances and I'm just I mean again with Alina we were just talking about well if you're a cold person you go and work in this particular part of the building and I just wonder how this ties in with our feeling of wanting our buildings to be very flexible you know that we want to look at our building and say well we can do anything here or there um, I don't know, Nick, whether you feel that we are sort of locking it down a bit because actually you've only got this one part of the building where you can do certain very demanding things. Well, this is a very good thought. Um, actually, the, the, we can go even further. The asymmetry, which I'm a great advocate of, um, has health benefits for us too. Uh, if you're in a car journey for ages, you want to get out and stretch your legs. So you actually want to stretch your legs. Otherwise, we'd be getting up in the night and stretching our legs every so often. What you want is a bit of variation. You want a different environment, some different air movement, and, and, and a, a different visual environment for a moment or two. And that, gives, that, that changes our cortisone levels. That gives us relief. So actually, I don't think all buildings should be the same on the inside. And you know what? An area with lots of light, say in an office, for example, we probably don't want loads of sun on our desk. 
but we do want to be able to go somewhere where there is loads of great space for example if you look at the work of fcb and alina you'll see that that's how they're designing these spaces with lots of uh, different um, experiences within them also applies to the museum environment as you described some objects have fugitive pigments within them red lake and so on and have to be kept hidden and only exposed very occasionally um, other works uh, perhaps made at the same time even with the same materials but in different colors would be very stable and could be put somewhere else in a much more dynamic environment um, so long as we understand what our needs are i think we can do far less control we can have spaces a little bit cooler for example outdoor classrooms they they work and, and, and you know and, and they're not warm uh, most of the year and you know perhaps they're a bit wet as well um they're very effective i think we need to be adaptive uh us and in a way we use buildings alina alluded to that and took sean earlier the the need for us to 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 have moving expectations um and perhaps be cold or, or, or be in an area of lots of air movement or an area with less air movement or higher brightness and lower brightness too uh, admittedly we don't want people to freeze but actually there are also uh, benefits regarding providing some temporal variation in all, some of these physical parameters actually providing a more stimulating environment so if you actually look you know what do we really mean by connectedness with the outside it is to do with stimulation as well and actually this temporal variation can sometimes be uh, really very helpful the way that humans behave. So indeed, some of these benefits have, uh, have affected the, um, the the design principles for some of the projects that I've worked on. And it's these additional stimuli uh, and therefore the increased productivity associated with this, which is overridden um, sort of the, the, the discussions. And in fact, the energy savings about, for example, moving to a naturally ventilated building have actually played second fiddle to some of the better, some of these more, the, the environments about trying to provide a better environment for people to work in. And I think another area where people have been talking or asking is around materials. Um, I mean, I'm very interested in the whole thing of timber um, and people are saying, how are we going to actually be able to use um, more timber on our buildings? You know, Alina alluded to it. Nick talked about it. And on the other hand, of course, we've got this thing which Nick also mentioned about how we all thought it was great to get, you know, night cooling, great thermal mass from exposed concrete and now um, we can't, or we don't think we should. Um, where are we going with all this? Just in the last few minutes we've got, I'd just be interested to hear where you'd like us to go with materials, um, what you feel the issues are and any way of overcoming the recalcitrance of the insurance industry. Alina. Okay. Um, well, I do think we should be trying to use more timber um, where it's where it's appropriate. Um, and um, so timber might not have as much in the way of thermal mass, but thermal mass is most useful when you have the opportunity for night cooling. So there are many building types where night cooling might not really be an option. Um, so we've got to balance out. No material should be off limits. Um, but each material should be used wisely where it's most appropriate. And um, there are lots of ways that we can introduce more, more timber into our buildings. And uh, with the industries uh, moving forward in terms of testing and better understanding so that the risks involved can be well managed and make sure that we have safe environments for people. And timber is such a lovely material that it creates a um, Lovely sense of well-being if you're in something with the warmth and the variety of timber. Well, speaking uh, first of all, just about thermal mass, as that was a good point uh, raised. Um, there are many alternatives to to concrete. Uh, some have been around longer than buildings. So a cave, uh, our original home, for <laughs> example, stone is fantastic in thermal mass. So it's brick. Um, so is any kind of weighty material, marble. If you ever stepped into a cathedral. And, and seen how, felt how cool it is compared to the outside weather well that's thermal mass as well um so i don't think we have to lose that principle at all in in in, in looking towards new materials but what i would advocate uh, uh, more than anything else is to use less material now that means primarily um it, where we can uh, making the existing building stuff work better uh, and, and continuing to, to to live live and, and work within it um as much as we possibly can and where we are designing new buildings to first think about minimizing the amount of material we use now perhaps that means as alina did more compact buildings um buildings with a better form factor 
buildings which use less structure um, that means that probably they aren't so tall um, perhaps they're a bit more uh, uh, wind efficient um, maybe they don't have huge basements um, all of those things uh, have a massive structural carbon impact um, and, and I think we could do an awful lot more in, in recycling and reusing materials uh, in, in construction there's not a lot of that it's an area that I, I'm hoping will grow and grow rapidly alongside the, 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 the use of natural materials timber being the obvious one um, stone being being another um, and, and there are plenty of other materials from hempcrete to, to, to round earth walls that are the low, low embodied impact too. There's a palette of natural materials. There are also principles in supporting buildings um, that are very different to the, 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 the um, steel and concrete structural framework that we've become familiar with because it's very efficient. If you look into nature, self-supporting forms are absolutely everywhere. And I hope that's a direction that design takes um, in, in minimizing our embodied carbon footprint. I suppose the one other thing we should touch on, and I know, you know, I, I've heard this said before, and I'm sure you're all thinking about it, but it's just worth remembering, is that, of course, when we are looking at the embodied carbon in a building, um, whereas the structure may be standing for the life of the building, we also have to look at the replacement cycles on uh, elements that go into them, because actually, of course, over the life, that's having a huge impact on the embodied carbon. Um, I think we've ranged far and wide. I think it's been fascinating um, to bring all those issues together around what I suppose is sort of decent living and comfort and using that with um, our, our massive concerns about carbon and also uh, our concerns about fresh air and COVID. It's been really interesting. I think it's been great to have uh, such a good selection of speakers uh, talking each from a different viewpoint but each with uh, so much knowledge and that knowledge has been complementary. Um, as somebody who has both had to work sometimes in a windowless room and once stayed in a hotel room with no windows, um, I'm certainly very aware how important this is. Um, and I'm delighted that there are so many people out there looking so hard at it and not only looking hard but sometimes telling us things which are against our instincts I, which is I think absolutely fascinating so I'd like to thank all of our audience uh, both for watching and all of those who sent in questions which I think really added to this um, of course I'd like to thank our speakers uh, for their time and for the quality of their contribution um, and on behalf of Shuko and on behalf of Architecture Today, just to say uh, thank you and we will look forward to seeing you at a future event.